guys, it is so nice out here right now. So, for today's read aloud, you got it. I'm reading outside. So, can you hear the birds? Such a nice day. So, we are going to read some refugee as I sit outside the school. Here's the track. Reading. So, we are on page 306. Isabel, Miami, Florida, 1994. Home. This was the coda to Isabel's song. She stood in with a trumpet in hand, a gift from Uncle Jerelmo, Lido's brother. She wasn't on a sidewalk in Havana, but in a classroom in Miami. It was her second week of school and the first day of band class, the day they auditioned for their places in the orchestra. Isabel twittered her fingers in the trumpet's keys. She couldn't believe she was standing here in this classroom less than a month after stumbling onto Miami Beach with her baby brother in her hands. So much had changed so quickly. After her mother and brother had taken to the hospital and given a clean bill of health, Lido's brother, Drilmo, took them in until they found a little apartment of their own. His apartment was smaller than their house in Cuba and not near the beach, but if Isabel never saw the ocean again, that was fine by her. Little Mariano was at home getting fat and happy along with the other babies mommy and mommy was paid to watch at the little in-house daycare she ran. Poppy had gotten a job driving taxi and was saving up for a car of their own. Senor Castillo planned to go back to school to become an American lawyer and Senor Castillo was already taking in someone about getting a loan to open a restaurant. Louis got in at the little bodega and Amara in a dress shop and once Amara became a U.S. citizen she planned to become a Miami police officer. They were going to be married in the winter. And Isabel, she had started the sixth grade. It was hard because she didn't speak English yet, but there were other Cuban kids there. Lots more Cuban kids and a few who had come by America by boat, like her mother, but more who had been born here. Cuban Americans who still spoke Spanish at home. Isabel had quickly made friends, girls and boys, who were warm and welcoming, and she knew she would learn to speak English like her teachers soon enough. She was practicing by watching lots and lots of television. At least that's what she told her parents. She would learn, and in the meantime, math and Spanish and art class and all still made sense. And so did music. Senor Villanova and the other students waiting for her to play. Isabel had practiced for weeks for this moment. At first, she couldn't decide what song to play. But then, while watching a baseball game with her father, she had figured it out. Isabel adjusted Ivan's Industrials baseball cap on her head, took a deep breath, and began to play the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem of the United States. But she didn't play it like she heard it at baseball games on television. She played it like the Sun Cabano, offbeat with a gojaro melody. Isabel played it salsa in salsa for Ivan, lost at sea, and for Lido back in Cuba. She played it salsa for her mother and her father who had left their homeland, and for the little brother Mariano who would never know the stress of Havana the way she did. And Isabel played it salsa for herself so she would never forget where she came from, who she was. Soon Isabel had everyone in the room clapping along to the beat with her, but as she played she learned a different rhythm, a beat underneath the one everyone else was clapping to. Her foot tapped in time with a hidden cadence and she realized with a thrill that she was finally hearing it. She was finally counting clave. Lita was wrong. She didn't have to be in Havana to hear it. To feel it, she had been brought to Cuba with her Miami. Isabel finished with a flourish and Shior Villanova and the other students' cheers. She thought she might cry of happiness, but she bit back her tears. She had done enough crying over Ivan and Lido. The song of her leaving Cuba to find a new home was over. Today, it was time to start a new song. We're on page 310, Mahoud, Berlin, Germany, 2015. Home. A German song Mahoud had never heard played before on the radio of the van that took him and his family through the streets of Berlin. The capital of Germany was the biggest city he had ever seen, far bigger than Aleppo. It was filled with nightclubs and cafes and shops and monuments and statues and apartments and office buildings. Almost all the signs were in German, but here they, were, they saw a sign of Arabic advertising, a clothing store or a restaurant or a market. Buildings lined the sidewalks like 10-story walls of bricks and glass, and cars and bicycles and buses and trams rattled and honked and clanged by the streets. This strange, frightening, exciting place was to be Mahoud's new home. The German government had taken in Mahoud and his family. For the past four weeks, the four of them had lived in a school in Munich that had been turned into a simple but clean housing for refugees. They had stayed there, free to come and go as they pleased, until a host family agreed to let them share their home while Mahoud's parents got on their feet. A host family here on this street in the capital of the country. 
The van pulled up to the curb outside a little green house with white shutters and an A-frame roof. Flowers filled the window boxes like Mahood had seen in Austria, and two German cars were parked in the driveway. Across the street, in a park, teenagers did tricks on skateboards. Mahood's father slid open the side door for them to climb out, and Mahood and his mother and brother grabbed the backpacks filled with clothes, toiletries, bedrolls, and the German relief workers had given them. The relief worker who'd driven them led Mahood's mother and father and brother up the steps to the front door of the little house. But Mahood stood for a moment on the sidewalk, looking around at the neighborhood. Mahood knew from his history class back in Syria that Berlin had been all but destroyed by the end of World War II, reduced to a pile of rubble like Aleppo was. Now it would take another 70 years for Syria to return from the ashes the way German had. Would he ever see Aleppo again? Cries of joy and welcome came from the porch, and Mahood followed his family up the steps. His mother was being hugged by an elderly German woman, and an elderly German man was shaking hands with his father. The German relief worker had to translate everything everyone said to each other. Mahood and his family didn't speak German yet, and the family apparently didn't speak any Arabic. The German family had at least managed to a sign written in Arabic that said, Welcome home on it, even if the expression, even if the expression they had used was a bit normal. Mahood still appreciated the effort. It was better than he could do in German. The man shaking hands with his father turned to Mahood and Walid, and what Mahood saw surprised him. He was a really old man. He had wrinkly white skin and thin white hair that stuck out a bit on the side like he'd tried to comb it, but it wouldn't stay put. When the relief worker had told them that they'd be staying with a German family, Mahood had imagined a family like his own, not like his grandparents. His name is Saul Rosenberg, the release for worker translated, and he says, welcome to your new home. As Mahood shook the old man's hand, he spotted a small, thin, ornate wooden box attached to a frame just outside the front door. Mahood recognized the symbol on the box. It was the Star of David, the sim same symbol on the flag of Israel. Mahood tried not to show his surprise. Not only was this couple old, they were Jewish. Back in the Middle East, Mahood knew Jews and Muslims had been fighting each other for the decades. This was a strange new world. Her Rosenberg's wife, broken away from Mahood's mother, had bent down to say hello. She was a wide woman, white-haired like her husband, with a big round glasses and a gap-tooth friendly smile. From the pockets of her frock, she withdrew a little stuffed animal, little stuffed rabbit made of white corduroy and offered to Willie. His eyes lit up as he took it from her. Frau Rosenberg made it herself. She's a toy designer, the translator explained. The old woman said something directly to Mahood. She says she would have made for one to you, the translator said, but she thought you might be too old for stuffed animals. Mahood nodded. She can make one for my little sister, though, when we find her, he told the relief worker. We had to hand her off to another boat to save her when we were drowning in the Mediterranean Sea. It was my fault. I'm the one who told my mother to do it, and now I have to find her and bring her back. Frau Rosenberg looked questioningly at the relief worker as he translated, and her bright smile faded. Waleed ran off to show his mother his new toy, and the old woman let Mahood into the hallway just inside the house, where the family pictures hung on the wall. I was a refugee once, just like you, the old woman said through the interpreter, and I lost my brother. She pointed to an old brown photograph in a picture frame of a mother and father and two children, a boy about Mahood's age in glasses and a little girl. The father and the son wore suits and ties, and the mother wore a pretty dress with big buttons. This, little, this girl was dressed like a little sailor. That's me there, the girl. That's my family. We left Germany on a ship in 1939 to try and get to Cuba to escape the Nazis. I was very little then, and I'm very old now, and I don't remember too much at that time, but I do remember my father being very sick in a cartoon about a cat. I remember that, and a very nice policeman who let me wear his hat. You guys understanding the connection here? She was the sister, right? Joseph's sister. My father was the only one to make it to Cuba. He lived there for many years, long after the war, but I never saw him again. He died before we could find each other. The rest of us couldn't leave the ship with him, and no other country would take us, so they brought us back to Europe just in time for the war, just in time to go on the run again. The Nazis caught us, and they gave my mother a choice, save me or save my brother. Well, she couldn't choose. How could she? So my tr brother chose for her. His name was Joseph. Mahood watched as she reached out gently to touch the boy in the photograph, leaving a smudge. He was about your age, I think. I don't remember much about him, but I do remember he always wanted to be a grown-up. I don't have time for games, he would tell me. I'm a man now, and when those soldiers said one of us could go free and the other would take in a concentration chap, Joseph said, take me. My just my brother, just a boy, becoming a man at last. 
She paused a moment, then took the picture down off the wall relentlessly with both hands. They took my mother and a brother away from me that day and left me alone there in the woods. I only survived because a kind old French lady took me in. She told the next Nazis who came knocking uh, that I was family. When the war was over and I was old enough, I came back here to Germany to look for my mother and my brother. I searched for them a long time, but they had died in the concentration camps, both of them. The woman drew a breath. I only have this picture of them because a cousin kept it. A cousin who was hidden away by a Christian family throughout the war. Here in Germany, I met my husband, Saul. He had survived the Holocaust. We stayed because he had family here, and we made a family of our own, Frau Rosenberg said. He, she spread her arms wide and turned in the little hallway, showing Mahood the dozens of pictures of her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She put her hand to the old yellowed picture of her family again. They died so I could live. Do you understand? They died so all these people could live. All the grandchildren and nieces and nephews they never got to meet. But you'll get to meet them, she told Mahood. You're still alive and so is your little sister. Somewhere. I know it. You saved her and together we'll find her. Yes, I promise. We'll find her and we'll bring her home. Mahood started to cry and he turned away and tried to blink back his tears. The old Jewish woman put her arms around him and pulled him into a tight hug. Everything's going to be all right now, she whispered. We'll help you. Ruthie, Kyofya, Roz Rosenberg's husband called to her. Mahu didn't need a translator to tell them that her husband wanted to join him in the living room. Did you guys hear that? His name is Ruthie. This is Ruthie as an adult. Mahu dragged a sleeve across his wet eyes, and Frau Rosenberg tried to hang the picture back on the wall. Her old hands were too shaky, though, and Mahu took it from her and hung it back on its nail for her. His gaze lingered at the picture. He was filled with sadness for the boy his age, the boy who had died so Ruthie could live. But Mahood was also filled with gratitude. Joseph had died so Ruthie could live. And one day, welcomed Mahood and his family into his house. The old woman gave Mahood's arm a squeeze and she led him into the living room. Mom and Dad were there. And Malid and Herr Rosenbug and the space was bright and alive and filled with books and pictures and a family and the smell of good food. It felt like home. <laughs>